Deep in the wilderness of North Berkshire County, Massachusetts, lies the state's tallest peak, known as Mount Greylock. In an analog horror by the same name, many disturbing things have been happening in the area surrounding the mountain. A shady government conspiracy, an ancient illness set loose, bodies falling from the sky, home invasions, and more await you in the ten tapes that Greylock has to offer thus far. Today, I'm going to go through every one of them and try to piece together exactly what's going on. If you've been on the channel before, welcome back. If not, hello, my name is Minaxa and today we're going to be taking a deep dive into the mystery of Greylock. But before we get to the rest of the video, I have to ask you a question. Are you going to have trouble sleeping tonight after watching me cover this scary analog horror series? Well then you'd probably like today's sponsor, Manta Sleep. Manta Sleep is a company that crafts specialized sleep masks to help you sleep or nap better and for longer. They have cooling masks, steam masks, weighted masks, and even a sound mask if you like to listen to things to help you fall asleep. The one they sent me was the sound mask, and I found that it definitely beats falling asleep with earbuds in, that's for sure. The headphones are high quality and impossible to feel, the material is perforated so it doesn't feel too stifling, and the battery life is 20 hours at 100%. I would genuinely recommend trying these out if you like to listen to ambient sound or ASMR to fall asleep. With all that being said, if you visit their website using the link below or use my code MANAXA, you can get 10% off your order. Head on down to mantasleep.com and start sleeping better tonight. The first tape in the series is called Back Online. It begins with a computer system coming back online after an emergency shutdown, which then turns on the camera system which provides our visuals for the episode. It seems like this place may have been abandoned for a while. The person who restarted the computer system attempts to log in, but their credentials are denied. Afterwards, they manage to somehow override the system and log in with administrative privileges. Administrator privileges granted. Welcome back, I'm on user ID. What would you like to do? During all this, the cameras are attempting to switch to the feed in the morgue, for some reason this place is a morgue, but an error prevents this from happening. From there, this individual attempts to extract information that was left behind on this computer system. What that information is exactly, we don't really know. Data extraction, 80% complete. Data extraction, complete. All data extracted to, error, no this introduction to the series is very short and very vague, as will be most things in this series. The crucial bits of information that should be taken from it are 1. There is someone with the ability to bypass the computer system login that has a reason to be extracting information from their computer systems, and 2. These computer systems seem to belong to an organization named Simeodyne USA. With that information mentally noted, we can move on to tape 2, To the Mountain. The second tape opens with dashcam footage. Presumably based on the title, we can probably say that they're driving along a road on or near Mount Greylock. The person driving has the radio tuned in to a sermon, which may seem unrelated now, but in hindsight will be very important thematically. He said, quote, our adversary the devil goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We are not to enter the thicket in search of the lion. We may pay dear- They arrive at a gate and stop the vehicle. The footage then switches over to a camcorder. Clearly the person is looking for something, otherwise they'd have no good reason to venture alone at night into the cold wilderness on the mountain. They spot a trail of blood and decide to follow it and at this point heavily distorted speech plays in the background, and I believe it might be a good hint as to what this person is doing out here. The 
We cut back to the car, and the sermon whether continues. Come face to face with the devil himself, whether we Something doesn't to feel quite right, leader. though. They're we driving incredibly slowly, and if you listen carefully, you can hear the signal 15, being used. Despite no apparent reasoning for it, I mean, there's no turn. Then they stop and fiddle with the high beams. Don't even know exists within themselves. The devil is gonna call to those depths, dear believer. Until and someone or something knocks very hard on the outside of the vehicle. And accept what it is that he bestows upon you. <laughs> Aside from what I've already pointed out, I wanted to save most of my thoughts on this tape for the analysis at the end. It's very vague, and like I said, most of the tapes will be vague, but not quite as vague as this one. It's hard to place. Even with every bit of information from the other tapes considered, I can't say with much confidence that I have any clue as to what happened. Instead, I think we should go ahead and move on to tape 3, Orientation Protocols. This video is perhaps one of the heaviest in terms of info dump of any tape in the series. Right away we have a lot of crucial information. For one, this is a government tape, and it's also intended for one individual's lone use, and his name is Alexander Michael Marsh. Keep that name in mind for later. Also worth noting is that this particular cassette cannot be viewed without specialized military grade hardware, and it was manufactured by Simeodyne USA with a date of January 2nd, 1993. From there, the tape labeled TF1 for Unit 13 goes on to congratulate the user for being selected as a testing candidate for what they're doing at Unit 13. Basically, it's a specialized research group collaborating with Simeodyne USA on Project Stargate to further delve into the world of the subconscious and psychic power. In our world, Project Stargate was a real CIA initiative to investigate the potential for psychic phenomenon for military and domestic purposes. It wasn't declassified until 1995, but I assume that's only because the CIA had concluded that it was useless. Go figure. In this universe, though, they found something tangible that they can work with. Thought forms. Thought forms, or tulpas in some religions and practices, are manifestations of a person's will, emotions, or other deep psychological aspects that can only be brought into existence through ridiculously consistent concentration and strong will. They were known to serve as familiars or companions, and it's worth noting that the tape makes sure to let you know that they can be formed unintentionally as well. In fact, the narration in this tape goes on to theorize that what we know as ghosts and most generic paranormal activity are actually the result of thought forms unintentionally created through the strong emotions of those mourning a recently deceased loved one. Because intentionally creating a thought form is long and arduous, requiring years upon years of work, the researchers at Unit 13 created a machine called the Thought Form Manifester. Many of these projects within Unit 13 are being led by a Dr. Bernard Hayes, another name to remember. Since thought forms created by the Thought Form Manifester come from the deepest depths of the human mind, they can take virtually any form you can think of. It can look like a person, an animal, an object, or even an abstract representation of a strong emotion. It's truly limitless, which is terrifying. The next section seems to be an attempt at reassurance, but the glitching of the tape seems to imply that whatever is being said is either not the whole truth, a misunderstood fact, or just a straight-up lie. There is no reason to be afraid, however. 
All thought forms are docile by nature, and while they may look or behave in a frightening manner, and though they are capable of making physical contact, they pose no threat to humans. Once your session in the thought form manifester is completed, your thought form will be securely transported directly into a containment chamber. Thought forms are unable to pass through the barrier of the manifester and will not be capable of causing you any issues. Finally, it ends on potential side effects, which are allegedly mild. Then we reach the end of the tape. There is a second part to this tape, but so far we have not seen it. What should we make of all this? Well, we were introduced to Simeodyne USA all the way back in the first tape, and this time we seem to be seeing them in their prime, conducting research on psychic beings known as thought forms. Thought forms are kind of like ghosts and can take basically any form. They can be created intentionally, unintentionally, or by force using the thought form manifester. We also have two names to keep track of, Alexander Michael Marsh and Dr. Bernard Hayes. Finally, it's worth mentioning that this tape must be given to the individual Alexander in 1993 at the earliest, which is going to end up actually being pretty far on the timeline as far as events in this series go. Now we can ramp things up with tape 4, Unexpected Visitors. This tape is arguably one of the most confusing ones, mainly because I don't understand why the first half is being recorded and arguably the second half as well. However, it seems to be someone outside of another person's house, watching them turn the lights off to go to sleep. Once the coast is clear, the person recording removes the screen from the window and initiates a home invasion. They proceed upstairs and then the camera goes black. Then we cut forward by an unknown amount of time to see them nonchalantly walking back to the forest and away from the house as if nothing happened. They then zoom in on the moon for a little too long, a strange detail to include. Then the footage cuts to a TV commercial for Max Headroom on ABC. My right, right, writers, my director, director, my friends, and you, the ordinary PP people who made me what I am today. Max Headroom premieres after Moonlighting tomorrow. Based on the date, I found out that it was the premiere of an episode named Dream Thieves with the synopsis, Dream Thieves steal the innermost workings of the human mind, record them, and exploit them on television. It may be a coincidence, but I find it pretty unlikely. It's probably a thematic reference to the thought form manifester, at the very least. It's also worth noting that this episode went live on October 9th, 1987, which leads me to believe that the events of this episode in particular are taking place on October 8th, but I do have a reason to discount that way, way later if you stick around for the analysis. Unfortunately, the commercial is interrupted by an emergency warning. It cuts to someone recording, with the warning on the TV playing in the background. Towards the end, several things were flashing on screen, including some pretty nasty gore that I won't show you guys. However, this picture, which seems to be depicting a face of some sort, is what I want to highlight. 
you are going to need to remember this face. Based on the information that we have so far, it would be easy to assume that the cause of these home invasions were escaped thought forms, but this is another instance in which I really can't say for certain what's going on even with the knowledge from every other tape. I can deposit some theories later on, but for now I think it would be best for us to transition into our next tape. Not here, not now, not anymore. This tape takes place during an ultrasound appointment. We learned that the woman getting the ultrasound's husband couldn't make it because of work. You too. No death this time. No, unfortunately, he couldn't get off work today. So I'm gonna have to call him on a payphone to let him know all the details as soon as we're done. <laughs> Both of them are very excited to be having a baby, and they've even been together since high school. But then something strange happens. Okay, hopefully this isn't too cold. No, it's okay. There he is. He's definitely a growing boy, that's for sure. And you're both looking really good. Oh, I love hearing that. Let's get some measurements to see exactly, yeah. exactly how much he's grown. The doctor, who is equally confused, attempts to play it off by saying the baby should still be there and that she's gonna go grab a different machine. You know what? Why don't we just see if we can borrow another machine, okay? There has to be something wrong with this one. I'll be right back. Um, okay. When she leaves, she seems to start discussing what's going on with another doctor outside who may have had the same thing happen to one of his patients. What are you talking about? For the first time in the series so far, the description actually has something to say. It reads, Do you know what they did up there? These are the consequences. There's also two newspaper articles, one that shows up at the end and one that flashes only briefly in the middle. I'll start with the more obvious one. It reads, Tiffany Mary Elaine Crisaldi, elementary school teacher, 29, of Rose Pine Drive, Adams, died unexpectedly Monday morning. She had suffered tremendously after the sudden loss of her unborn son, Maxwell Marsh, on March 31st. She was unable to live with the heartache any longer. Born in Windsor, Massachusetts on May 20th, 1958, she was the only child of Harrison and Kathleen Crisaldi. She attended school in Adams, Massachusetts and graduated in 1976 from Grand Hill Regional High School among the top of her class. She went on to graduate from North Adams State College in with a degree in early childhood education. During her freshman year of high school, she began dating Alexander Marsh, the man who would become her... If you were paying attention, you should remember the name Alexander Marsh as the patient from Tape 3. Now we've established a connection between at least two of the tapes. Another important thing to note is that since she died at 29 and was born in 1958, we can extrapolate that these events took place in 1987, which is a year we've seen before. There's also another article that flashes briefly when the ultrasound gets disturbed, and that one reads, Bizarre events leave Berkshire in terror, authorities mute. Adams, days after the unexpected events that left an unknown number of people dead and terrified, authorities offering any kind of explanation. Despite the fact that the Massachusetts government engaged the emergency broadcast system, neither they nor any police department, while it's been impossible to ascertain exactly what occurred, a number of arrests have been made, with some witnesses claiming that the attacks were by people they never thought would be capable of such atrocities. I was in complete shock, said Theodore K., who happened to witness one of the suspects being, and from there, it cuts off. 
So this is clearly referring to the events from the previous tape, the home invasions. However, I think the most crucial takeaway here is when it says some witnesses claiming that the attacks were by people they never thought would be capable of such atrocities. In my opinion, this is a big clue, but we don't have the context we need for it to matter quite yet. The last thing I want to point out before we move on is that this showed up alongside of the quick newspaper flash during the disturbance. Again, it's the same face from before. All right. With all that in mind, let's go on to Tape 6, Sleeping Dogs. This tape opens with a seminar from the North American Council on Thought, and it occurred on October 4th, 1981. The speaker is none other than Dr. Bernard Hayes. Specifically, the speech is about Jungian psychology and the manifestation of consciousness, which makes sense considering the research we know he assists with later on. Jungian psychology originates from the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung, who believed that a crucial step to understanding psychology lay in paying close attention to the subconscious. How fitting. I'll elaborate on his thoughts on psychology later on, because it's actually going to be ridiculously important. In terms of the actual content of what he's saying, well, I'll let you listen for yourself. Humanity was still tireless. greeted by a Simeodyne computer system very similar to that from the first tape. This time, we know for sure that this is taking place in 1987 once again. So just like in tape 1, the required credentials are bypassed by someone with administrative privileges and they're greeted by an unknown user ID. By system administrator. Greetings, no user ID. Welcome to Simeodyne USA's virtual message assistant for user. Project Director, Frank Porter. Whoever is accessing these files, it's certainly not to the Project Director. So what does this Project Director have to hide here? Well, he seems to have received several messages over the course of about a week from Paul Morelli of the Morelli Mining Company. The project Frank is responsible for seems to be the construction of a redacted facility but I have a feeling that we already know what it is and what it's for. Let's hear what Paul has to say. Hey Frank, it's Paul Murray. We ran into somewhat of an issue today. We came across these tunnels inside the mountain, pretty deep in, but uh, well, this is gonna sound a little crazy, but he told me to call if anything strange came up and uh, I figured this qualifies. People have been here before. Some obviously man-made shit in there, like, carvings and stone. This shit looks ancient, like real old. I took a crew in to look through it, but since part of the tunnels caved in some time ago, we're gonna just have to bust through it regardless. But I still wanted to make you aware of it. Anyways, I'll keep you in the loop. Thanks. Even from just this first message, we get a lot. Apparently Paul was told to call Frank specifically if anything weird came up, as if he knew something weird would come up. On top of that, finding ancient relics of past civilizations during some random routine excavation feels like a pretty big deal. Paul's next message is from early the next morning, saying that some of his workers have suddenly come down with a sickness and that things might be a bit slower than usual. Not too out of the ordinary, right? Well, what is out of the ordinary is that the tunnel cave-in he and his crew discovered the day before has been cleared and rigged with lights without his or his night crew's knowledge. He assumes that Frank had something to do with it, but it still doesn't really make sense. To make matters worse, the crew claimed that they saw something in the woods at night. Something like a tall man. 
Paul assumes it's a random environmentalist who's protesting the fact that they're doing work on this mountain and ends his message to Frank with that before hanging up. Moron trying to call some shit, but you know, he ain't done nothing, so I told him to keep focused on the project. For safety's sake, we're gonna avoid the tunnel until I hear back from you. Alright, bye now. Message 3. March 25th, 456 p.m. The next message is from the evening later that same day. Another person gets sick, this time from Frank's end. One of the members of Paul's team, who used to be an archaeologist, Arnold Rivers, is named and referred to Frank for any additional information on the ancient artifacts that they found in the tunnels. The next day, Paul gets increasingly concerned. Frank, something ain't right here. Crew's getting worse, more sick. I, I feel okay so far, but I, I don't know how long that's gonna last. I saw that thing the guys have been talking about last night stalking around in the tree line. I swear it had a face. Uh, anyways, just, just call me back as soon as you can, Frank. The day after that, all of their food has gone rotten for seemingly no reason. The weather was fine and they were doing everything properly. Then that afternoon, they see whatever entity has been stalking them once again and decide to put up hunting cameras. Something out here with us. It's in the woods, and it's, it's watching us, goddammit. It ain't no animal either. Who of you guys gonna put up those fancy hunting cameras and see if we can catch anything? Maybe locals fucking with us? I don't know. We'll, we'll figure it out. But yeah, anyways, I, I just... <laughs> Message 7 doesn't seem to have gone through properly, but the system glitching does allow us to briefly catch a glimpse of what this project was for, and just as we thought, it's the construction of the Unit 13 facility. That night, motion is detected in the forest again, this time it's some sort of smoke or aura. It kind of seems like a thought form. The next night, Paul calls again, increasingly frantic. Frank, it's Paul. Uh, well, a lot of the crew here is sick now, and they're sort of like unresponsive. We tried emergency contacts for them, but they're down there. Just keep ringing. The phones, they just, they just kept ringing and ringing and ringing. Just tried 911, still nothing. I figured the phones were fucked up, but the machine actually picked up. <laughs> caught whatever's going around. My skin, it feels, it feels tight, a lot of pressure behind my eyes, my, my teeth feel like they're, they're humming, they're vibrating. You know what? I just all started when we came across that tunnel. I feel like I, I need to figure out what's down there. I think whatever's down there could help my crew, but most of all, I feel like something really bad's gonna happen if I don't go down, so I'll be going down tonight. <laughs> then, motion detected. Once again, around 12 in the morning, and this time, it seems more like a ghost caught on camera. Could this maybe be a thought form? Let's hear Paul's final message. Even after this message, there's still one more motion detection on the hunting cameras. There's that entity, again. The description this time reads, 
There came a red flash as it pitched from heaven. Corruption wrought truth. 0707. Even though I personally think this tape is one of the more confusing ones, I will try to give some brief thoughts on it. I feel like Frank knew the miners would be finding something under that mountain. I mean, how could he not? Seeing as he asked Paul to call him specifically and may have even sabotaged all of their phone lines intentionally, leaving only his open. It also seems as if the crew were physically unable to leave the site, being stalked by the monster or entity and having all of their food rot for no reason. It really seems as if they were sent in there to die. The title Sleeping Dogs is likely a reference to the phrase Let Sleeping Dogs Lie, which basically means that you shouldn't interfere with an already bad situation because you might just make it worse. I think this is trying to tell us that perhaps these tunnels are something that shouldn't have been meddled with, but regardless, we can only theorize. Let's move on to tapes 7 and 8. Tape 7 is really short, but still tells us quite a lot. It seems to be a segment on the local news channel, talking about the break-ins that happened in Tape 4, with its host, being Don Wright. This broadcast takes place two weeks after the incident. It seems normal at first, but there's a lot of glitching in the video feed and information that seems a little suspicious, knowing what we do. Apparently the story the public is being told is that it was an act of terrorism by an anti-American local militia group, and that several arrests were made and that local police should have gotten everything back to normal. Conveniently, the video distortion leaves out the name of the alleged militia group, probably because, in my opinion, it's irrelevant and untrustworthy information. I think the public is being blatantly lied to. Just as Don is giving his confident reassurances to the people, this happens. Thankfully, due to the continued efforts of law enforcement, life has been able to return back to normal. Back, back to normal. To no back to normal. To normal. To normal. To normal. to normal for residents of Berkshire County. There is a briefly shown news article during that sequence. It says, These events are only the tip of the iceberg, says Jim Melgreen, a former police officer who now works as a private investigator and hosts a radio show centered around government transparency and accountability. There are horrifying reports of people, healthy grown adults, becoming deformed, growing extra limbs, teeth growing out of their scalp, people developing severe mental conditions or even sicknesses doctors have never seen. And that's where that cuts off. If you were watching Greylock on its playlist, the ending of Tape 7 should perfectly segue into Tape 8. Back to normal for residents of Berkshire County. It starts with a screen of the channel experiencing technical difficulties, which then transitions into a conversation between one of the channel executives and two of its producers. I think it would be best if I just played this part on its own. Well, that broadcast went completely tits up, didn't it? I've been getting chewed out by our asshole CIA liaison for the past two hours. What the fuck happened? Our engineers believe that the signal was hijacked before we even reached the transmitter, but once we started receiving phone calls from viewers, we switched to a backup transmitter. But by then, the hijacker had already said everything they wanted to say, hadn't they? Mm, yes, sir. Don, where the fuck is he? I can't get hold of him, and he needs to get in here and read a statement to help clean up this fucking mess. Uh, well, we've been trying to reach him. We've called him multiple times. We've tried his pager. We've asked around to see if anyone's heard from him, but nothing. You've been to his house? Uh, well, no. I just thought that maybe he'd be upset if I did that. So get in your fucking car and go to his fucking house! I don't care if you kick down his front door and drag him here by his ear. You bring him into the studio. Do you understand? Yes, Mr. Rosenbaum. Of course, I'll do that right now. 
has some real powerful people depending on us right now. They need us to manage the response to these events, to let the public know what's going on, and the last thing we need is it going wider than it already fucking has. So do what you need to do, or I'm going to replace you with some producers who actually know how to produce a fucking show. From here, we transition into what is once again someone trying to access files on a computer system. But something isn't right. Whoever is attempting to access this file has stumbled into something impossible. Warning. Anomalous file detected. This file should not exist. Are you sure you wish to proceed? A file that does not exist. Regardless, we get to see the file, and it's a log left behind by the archaeologist from the Morelli mining team. If you remember the name, it's Arnold Rivers. The date is April 8th. 1987, about a quarter past nine at night. I was involved in the Morelli construction project at Mount Greylock. I was hired due to my background in anthropology and archaeology. I've worked to excavate a number of different historical sites. Paul Morelli took me on after securing a government contract for the Greylock project. I'm recording this because I believe my life is in danger, and I likely don't have a lot of time left so I need to leave some kind of record of my findings. He talks about how he was hired for his experience in archaeology and anthropology, and how on March 25th, Paul cleared the tunnels and asked Arnold to venture in with him and his crew. This makes no sense, because the Paul we know had to ask Frank, who cleared the tunnels. Something isn't right here. Then he drops perhaps the most shocking revelations in the entirety of Greylock thus far. But what we discovered in that mountain was not normal. Not only did I see the impact it was having on the crew, but certain aspects of my findings did not make any sense. Many of the artifacts were pre-colonial. Some were from Native American tribes, but there were other artifacts, some Mesoamerican and Others were shockingly Clovis in nature. Finding Clovis artifacts here means that people have been coming to Mount Greylock since at least 11,000 BCE. But that's not all, no. There are artifacts I found that could potentially be from even earlier, Paleo-American cultures that we have yet to even begin studying. The artifacts under the mountain predated the American colonists predated the Native Americans, and even predated other societies known to have existed thousands of years ago. But it gets even more ridiculous. Cultures that were never explicitly known to have crossed the Atlantic before Columbus, such as ancient Chinese, Indians, Romans, basically everywhere around the world, have been to this very mountain before. Originally, Arnold was excited because he's an archaeologist and an anthropologist. This is a ridiculous discovery. But what he discovered as he ventured further into the mountain haunted him for the rest of his life. How could such a place be so important to so many cultures for so long? There must be something immense here. The tunnels all connected to a series of chambers deep into the interior of the mountain. That's where a majority of the relics were found. There were old baskets of herbs and spices, pottery, weapons and armor, talismans, other religious items, countless other things, but all of it was there purposely as offerings. These cultures were not gathering here for no reason. No, they were here to worship something. Suddenly, we cut to a TV program from the same channel as before, and we learn that the show that we saw getting hijacked is called Don Wright Tonight, presumably featuring Don as the host. The next section will make more sense once again if I just play it for what it is. It was billions of years ago, when our planet was still mostly fire and rock, that a Mars-sized planet that had been drifting through our solar system collided directly with the Earth. The impact was so powerful and violent that the rogue planet was blown into countless pieces of debris. This debris collected to form our moon. Many of the pieces of the unknown planet remain inside the Earth to this day. 
Then we transition into a 911 phone call from Liam, one of the show's producers. Adams Police Department, dispatcher Carrie speaking. Um, yes, I'm calling to report a break in at my co worker's house. What is your name, sir? My name is Liam Hollander. Okay, Liam, you said this was your co worker's house. What is your co worker's address? Uh, it's on uh, Parker, Parker Hill Road in Adams, uh, number 491. 491 Parker Hill Road, is that right? Yes. Okay, can you tell me, is anybody hurt? Liam, are you still with me? Yes, sorry. Is anybody hurt? Yes. Suddenly, we're taken back to Arnold's logs. He continues describing his findings, how he found evidence of massive amounts of animal and human sacrifice. Arnold, despite not getting sick the same as the other workers for whatever reason, has been noticeably impacted emotionally and mentally by the discoveries that he made. He even tried to reason with Frank, the project director, who disregarded his concerns entirely. When Arnold said he would not be coming back to the project, Frank insisted that he does, offering a raise and even trying to convince him by saying he'd be responsible for the biggest historical finding of all time. Arnold, who valued his continued livelihood and sanity above fame and fortune, refused a second time, especially because he knew what happened to the other sick workers. And now it's time for us to find out what happened too. Morelli Greylock event, group C, survivor data. Some were luckier than others. Most of them were changed physically, though a few were still recognizable at least. Almost all of them were negatively affected mentally though, from violent tendencies to paranoia to manipulation to straight up cannibalism, arguably the worst of them. Previously, Scott Oakhurst attacked and consumed six staff members on April 6th of 1987, all the while laughing maniacally. For those who met fates such as that, the physical changes were so massive that they started straying from what you could even define as human. Quarantine or straight up euthanasia was a common suggestion for many of them. For some odd reason, Frank was eerily quick to accept Arnold's second refusal. He wished him best of luck on future endeavors and then hung up. Obviously, this instilled a massive sense of paranoia in Arnold since it seemed pretty unlikely he'd be allowed to live with the knowledge of everything that happened during the project. He describes some other stuff that's been going on too. These things that have been happening around the mountain, the home invasions, the dead bodies that have fell from the sky over Cheshire, the pregnancy phenomena, so many other unexplainable things. They all must be related, and I've been trying to figure out how. He's attempted to connect with a certain local investigator about what's going on, and that might be our Jim Melgreen from before, but Arnold also noted that his front door had been left unlocked when he came back from getting groceries the other day, instilling even more paranoia and fear into him. After checking all of the light bulbs in his house with ridiculous scrutiny after the fact, he couldn't find anything, no microphone or camera that's hidden somewhere, nothing. At this point, Arnold was able to point out his slipping sanity in the third person, but he's glad that he was at least able to record everything. Thank God for that. I'm glad that I put all of this into a recording. Perhaps that was what I needed to snap me out of this. Honestly, I feel much better just talking about it. <gasps> this can't be. Oh my God, that's a basement door. Oh, no, 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 no,
Come on out, it's the police. Here's that damn entity, this weird masked entity again. This tape was the longest by far, and it gave us a hell of a lot of info. I think that this masked entity has to be intelligent. It seems to act with defined purpose, and it specifically benefits Simeodyne in covering up these government conspiracies and happenings occurring all over the area of Mount Greylock. Clearly, there is a lot more to this that we're not seeing. I can't even give a clear reason as to why Don was killed and by who, though it seems to be from a group that knows that the public is being manipulated and doesn't take too kindly to that fact. The biggest revelation that was made was definitely the clarification on the tunnels within the mountain and what they were used for. I think I have a rough idea as to what it might be trying to tell us, but that I'll have to save for later. For now, let's go ahead and move on to Tape 9, Trojan Technology. This tape begins with a file being recalled on the same computer system we've heard multiple times at this point. It then shows us what I think is a vintage radio broadcast advertising the National Access Initiative. I think it's no coincidence that the logo of this radio station looks similar to that from the TV station that we recently saw. This National Access Initiative seemed to have been set into place during the presidency of Lyndon B. Johnson, which was during the 1960s. The goal of the initiative was to place critical electronics such as radio, television, and phones into every American household, regardless of whether you were wealthy or not. The idea is great, in theory. Let's give everyone a means to communicate, even if they don't have the money to buy the electronics. In the real world, President Johnson was famous for attempts to expand public broadcasting, his focus on civil rights, and overall trying to make life easier for those who lived in poverty. So this whole thing is pretty appropriate. Unfortunately for those in the Greylock universe, the electronics packages were being provided by Simeodyne. The tape goes out of its way to describe them as being world-renowned technology manufacturers. The video then briefly cuts to a newspaper showing that President Kennedy actually denied Simeodyne's original push for the initiative, before then switching to a newspaper detailing his eventual assassination and the swearing-in of President Johnson. Then, we see what looks like security footage of the inside of someone's home in July of 1966. In fact, we get to see quite a few of these, actually, including someone sleeping in their own bed being watched. Something interesting to note is that these all have different time zones, meaning these are completely different parts of America, which is implying that the reach of this thing is insane. They're spying on people in the entire country. After this, we get an interview from then-president of Simeodyne USA, Percival C. Rothwell. The things that he says are pretty convincing. Basically, his speech summarized is him describing how people who can't forward modern electronics are inadequately prepared to respond to emergency situations relative to many others, and that the goal of the initiative spearheaded by Simeodyne is to rectify that disparity. However, part way through his speech, it switches to him talking about something else. What it is we're working on at any given time inside Simeodyne? And for decades, we've kept it all quite secret. But I'll let you in on a little something. Out here. Kennedy didn't go for it. But you assured me he was available. Or was that just one of your bullshit? Well, he's gonna fucking expose our whole plan for the NAI program. The meeting couldn't have gone worse. If that fucking Nick thinks he's going to expose Simeodon, he's got another thing coming. But well, we're not the only ones he's pissed off lately. After rejecting Operation Northwoods, and then that executive order involving the Federal Reserve, 
There are a lot of snakes in the grass. And it's about time that Kennedy got bit. So, we don't know who he's talking to, but this exposes a lot of what actually happened. Simeodyne either directly or indirectly orchestrated Kennedy's assassination in this universe. The mention of Operation Northwoods, which was a real proposal to frame the Cuban government for acts against the US that would warrant starting a war, is actually pretty interesting. But the plan wasn't declassified until November of 1997. What does this mean? It means that Simudine has had a deep running connection to the American government for a lot longer than their projects in earlier tapes, like in the 80s and 90s. He describes how the only reason humanity got this far is because they stood strong together, which is more pretty solid reasoning and campaigning for the initiative. Meanwhile, more surveillance footage is intercut in the speech. At 6.10, a frame flashes that shows us a different image of the masked entity that we've never seen before. It has no cracks, and it's red. Not sure what to make of it, but it's pretty interesting. The next instance of surveillance footage has skipped forward by decades, October 1990. I think this tells us all we need to know about the NAI program. The next one skips to 1993. Then, the applause, followed by a picture of many cloaked entities wearing masks not dissimilar to the one we're already familiar with. From there, the radio broadcast continues to describe how it will be first made available to crucial infrastructure such as schools and police departments, and that it will take time to arrive in certain areas. Before it has time to elaborate on this any further, we cut to more surveillance footage. This one is dated December 29th, 1994, which I think ends up being the farthest date that we get to explicitly see. Shortly after we start viewing this surveillance footage, an unidentified creature rises from the shadows in the corner of the room. Based on the information that we just learned, I think it might be safe to say that this quote-unquote imaginary friend was actually a thought form that followed the young girl Katie home. It cuts back to the ending of the radio broadcast describing a nationwide release of mid-1966 to early 1967, which lines up with the first surveillance footage that we got to see at the beginning. 
Finally, to end off this tape, one last bit of surveillance footage. Hello, you've reached Alex Marsh and Tiffany Crisaldi. We're not able to get to the phone, so please leave a message after the tone and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. This video taught us a lot about the nature of Simeodynans and organization. It seems like they can't possibly be up to any good, and may be responsible, at least partially, for a lot of the events that we've seen transpiring throughout the story. Based on this stuff at the end, we can also assume that the Crystaldis, which we've seen bits and pieces of info strewn throughout the tapes for thus far, will come back into play very soon. However, based on the information in the tenth and final tape as of making this video, their stories might be far more important to the overall narrative than we could have ever initially realized. Without further ado, let's go ahead and check out Tape 10, Messages from the Dead. Tape 10 begins with footage of an individual recording themselves walking through the forest. Eventually, they seem to come across and examine the lifeless body of a rat, and I do want to point out that the gloves that they're wearing are pretty similar to the ones that I think we saw in the window in Unexpected Visitors, but I'm not sure if this is just a coincidence or if it actually means anything. Why this individual decided to pick up this rat in the forest is something we'll find out later, but for now, the footage cuts back to the same visual of the clock and answering machine that we saw at the end of the previous tape. Let's have a listen to what it has to say. Hey, babe. I'm just checking in. Could you please give me a call as soon as you can? Don't worry about work, either. Please. You're way more important, okay? Okay. I love you. Bye. After that first voicemail, it cuts to Alex sitting at a table across from a man listening to his account of what happened the day Tiffany was found dead. He describes how after they lost the baby, he stayed home from work for about a month to comfort his wife but eventually had to return to work. They made an agreement that every day during his lunch break he would call home to check on her, and she picked up every single time. But on that day, she didn't. Tiffany, babe, uh, still haven't heard from you. Hope everything's okay. You're probably just busy doing something, but... We've been talking every day since I've been back to work, so, you know, just, I'm getting a bit worried, so, please call me back, okay? We then briefly get to see what looks like some sort of ritual. At this point, Alex's concern has been elevated enough for him to go home early and check on his wife, Tiffany. Then we hard cut to a screen showing a login prompt. The background reads, Office of Chief Medical Examiner, Massachusetts. Then we get the report. Dr. Heinrich Albrecht, Medical Examiner, Westfield. May 19th, 1987, 3.23 p.m. Intake report for Tiffany Elaine Marie Crisaldi. For some reason, whilst her description is being read out, the playback has a difficult time settling on her age for an unknown reason. This is interesting, because it seems to settle on 28 when the article from way back said 29. For whatever reason, Tiffany's age has discrepancies. Immediately after, we see a terrifying visual glitch, which also shows a scripture in the caption box. Adams Police Department. The scripture, Revelations 9, 6, reads as follows, And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. I'll talk about what that might mean a little later. After that, we get to see what Tiffany's body actually looks like, and it's really unusual. A black substance leaks out from her eyes and mouth. The main issue that caused the need for this specialized autopsy was the markings made on her stomach. According to the doctor, due to a lack of hemorrhaging around the wound, these markings must have been made after death, which is very concerning because it makes a suicide look like a homicide, which is probably why Alex seems to be taken in for questioning. Before we get time to process all of that information, we cut to a therapy session with a younger Tiffany. So, Tiffany, you just had your sixth birthday, didn't you? Yeah. Did you have a party? Yeah. 
How was it? Good. That's good. You're awfully quiet today. Are you seeing them again? Yes. You see them right now? Yes. Where are they? Where are they, Tiffany? They're <laughs> everywhere. It seems that this section is recounting a therapy session that Tiffany had when she was much, much younger, at just six years old. Though there seems to be that strange discrepancy with her age, she was allegedly born in 1958, which would place this session at 1964, the earliest dated event in the series. Back then, she was seeing things, seeing things that aren't normal. Perhaps Tiffany was able to see thought forms. After that, we cut to the personal log of the doctor that we had just met. Tiffany's body had apparently arrived just before he was meant to leave the office for the day, but he decided to at least to do the external analysis regardless. During this, the room had strange electrical flickers and spikes in temperature, which to me certainly suggests some kind of thought form activity. Something else strange also happened while he was working with the body. I wanted to refrain from mentioning this part whatsoever, but after placing Miss Chrysalvi in storage and moving on to cleaning up, my sister Sarah mentioned that she'd heard what sounded like a woman crying coming from the direction of the cooler. I shrugged off her remark and let her leave early, telling her she was likely stressed or overtired, and I continued cleaning up on my own. I didn't dare to tell her that I heard it as well. Then we cut back to Tiffany's therapy session once again. In this part, the doctor seems to be using a type of hypnosis-based therapy in order to help Tiffany work through her problems, asking her to describe her house and front yard in great detail. He slowly instructs her to advance further towards and then into the house, and then upstairs towards her bedroom. It's actually a pretty soothing and calming experience to listen to. And you start walking nice and calmly towards it. You see the door coming closer with each step. You can see the pink flower stickers that you put on it two years ago, and the small wooden sign that reads Tiffany, with the little blue bird in the corner. Step. 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 You almost forget that you're watching an analog horror series, but the dread of knowing that something must go wrong at some point lingers in the back of your mind as Tiffany advances through the house. It's brilliantly made suspense. I believe this may be the doctor's attempt to pry into Tiffany's unconscious mind to learn more about why she's having the issues that she has. If you remember when I mentioned Jungian psychology previously in the video, this type of therapy isn't too detached from his ideas. The doctor makes specific attempts to describe how everything is exactly the way that it should be, with the only difference being that Tiffany is alone in the house rather than surrounded by family as she probably is normally. You feel comfortable. You feel safe. You are alone. It isn't until she gets into her upstairs bedroom and finishes scanning her surroundings that she notices the first inconsistency in this entire mental exercise. You walk into a room, and that's when you can see something different that's never been there before. Tell me what you see. It's... It's a door next to my window. That's right, it's a door. Walk to the door and open it. I'm scared. It doesn't matter if you're scared. You must open the door. Once this strange door in her mind has been opened, the video feed glitches and the music fades, and the uneasy tension that's been lingering the entire time starts to truly set in. Small room. Somebody's in there. No, Tiffany, you're alone. No, no, there's 
someone here. He's facing away from me. He's standing and tall. He's very tall. Tiffany, you are alone. There's a TV. The screen is all fuzzy. And the tall man is watching it. Tiffany, I want you to focus on removing the man from your mind. When I snap my fingers, he will be gone. You will be alone. The man's shaking. His body is cracking. Okay, Tiffany, I'm going to count down from five. When I snap my fingers, you will return to the real world. Five. You're feeling more awake. He's turning around. Four. Everything around you is becoming He's hazy. He's looking at me. He sees me. Three, Tiffany. You can feel the chair you're sitting in again. Two. Everything around you fades to the blackness behind you. One. The full control of your body. Zero. We're awake, Tiffany. You'll return to reality now. We see a desk. If you remember from the beginning of the tape, there was a person searching the forest who found a rat corpse, or maybe it's a prop, who knows. For whatever reason, upon using scissors to cut into the rat, a tape is retrieved. I'm not sure if this rat is meant to be a prop in the universe, or why a tape is inside of the rat, or how this person knew to randomly go to the forest to find it where it was. Regardless of any of those questions, the cassette is shoved into a player, and we hear a message to end our final tape. Finally, the description reads, The serpent's right eye was plucked from his head and was transformed, and engulfed in a great flame that was fashioned to provide light for all of creation. And lo, it was made to nourish the earth, so that life might thrive and flourish from it. And that is where Greylock, as of now, ends. Or at least, that would have been the case if Tape 11 didn't just come out. This part is going to be unscripted, because this is a very last minute change to the video, but uh, Tape 11 came out while I was asleep, the day before the video was supposed to go live. So I'm going to briefly talk about it. Uh, it doesn't seem to have anything ridiculously important as far as I know. It looks like it might have a connection to that uh, little ritual section from Tape 10. Um, and it also is uh, on the channel that tapes 7 and 8 and etc. highlight and tape 9 with the radio. So just wanted to briefly talk about that. Uh, I'm not going to dedicate a huge portion to it. And from here, we're going to go on to the analysis. And the analysis will not be considering that video because this video was supposed to be done. So sorry about that. But yeah. All right, well, now we're at the part where I have to try to figure out what's going on. If you've been on the channel for long enough, you've probably realized by now that the format I prefer to use is to set up a timeline of events with theories and possible explanations along the way. But uh, if you can't tell, this series is probably the most dense in terms of the sheer amount of information that I've ever covered. But despite all that, I'm going to try my best either way. 
I think that the very first event in Greylock is actually from a rather dismissible, easy to miss detail from Tape 8. There's a short segment that describes how the moon was formed when a Mars-sized planet collided with Earth, and how pieces of the ancient planet are still stuck inside of Earth's crust to this day. I've heard a few theories regarding the significance of this, but I don't really like any of them, but unfortunately, I don't really have any of my own either. It's not the only time the moon seems to be a weird point of focus either, with a pretty long portion in Tape 4 being dedicated to it, as well as the cameras in Tape 6 usually being activated at 12am near the moon's peak in the sky. Overall, I think we don't have enough information to make anything out of this weird moon thing, but it felt worth pointing out, just in case any of you guys have good ideas. After that, we know that at some point in the distant past, Mount Greylock has been compelling people from various times and places all across the world towards it. At some point, the tunnels and areas of worship and sacrifice were made and used underneath the mountain. I believe the deity that they were worshipping under the mountain is this masked entity that we've seen time and time again, and I also believe he is very likely to be the main antagonistic force of the series. It's hard to back this up with any evidence aside from his frequent appearances, because there are so many different threats in the series, it's impossible to know what's really going on. If we skip forward to about the late 1800s, Percival's great-great-grandfather founded the technology company Simeodyne. I believe that, on the surface, this is all Simeodyne is to the public, just a technology manufacturing and distributing company. However, based on the absurd amount of global influence that the organization seems to have, along with their involvement in many government conspiracies and their knowledge of Mount Greylock, it leads me to believe Simeodyne has much more under the surface than we've even begun to realize with our entire knowledge from tapes 1 through 10. In the 1960s, Simeodyne is responsible, at least partly, for the Kennedy assassination and the employment of the NAI program, which is secretly a method of spying on the American populace. Tape 9 has many interesting details, such as the red mask seemingly overlaid over the CEO's face, and the group of cloaked mask-wearing people. My personal theory is that Simeodyne is a modern collection of descendants of people who used to worship in the tunnels under the mountain. This would explain why Simeodyne even knows about it in the first place. A much younger Tiffany has been going to hypnosis-based therapy sessions, and based on what we see in the tape, she seems to have an innate ability to see things that aren't described to us in detail. We can assume that these are thought forms, but what was up with the tall man that had his body cracking in her mind? Well, it's not the first time that the masked entity has been described as a tall man, and with that description of his body cracking, it feels like, for whatever reason, Tiffany has some acute affiliation with thought forms and with the masked entity. She's become a lot more important than just a mother who mysteriously lost her baby at this point. One thing I thought was interesting about this session is that the doctor seemed pretty familiar with her, and also almost seemed to expect what happened during their session. At the very least, he expected the door by the window. I think this doctor might be more important than we might know, but only time will tell. From this point, we get a pretty large gap in things that we actually get to see happen. The closest thing from here is all the way in 1981 with Dr. Hayes' Symposium on Jungian Psychology. The fact that Jungian Psychology is specifically highlighted here is more important than you realize, as I believe it to have incredible thematic significance. Let me explain. In Jungian psychology, a person can be thought of as an iceberg. The tip is what that person shows to everyone else, and everything under the water is what Jung coined a person's shadow. This shadow is a representation of the unconscious mind, and is composed of repressed ideas, weaknesses, desires, instincts, and shortcomings. It's the part of you that you don't like. It's free from any adjustments you make to the face that you show the outside world. I think this idea is directly related to the thought form manifester, as well as the idea of Simeodyne being a sort of secret secondary government literally hiding in the shadows. The reason why thought forms that are created through normal means, via intense self-reflection over a long period of time, are not aggressive 
and generally act as familiars is because it's people coming to terms with their shadow. It's literally another version of themselves. Carl Jung himself once said, the shadow is a living part of the personality and therefore wants to live with it in some form. It cannot be argued out of existence or rationalized into harmlessness. Essentially, those who create thought form familiars correctly will quite literally be living alongside their shadow. With the thought form manifester though, the thought form is created through a person's shadow without any sort of reflection or real effort. The creation of aggressive thought forms that look straight out of nightmares is the result of this process. But I'm getting ahead of myself, we don't even learn about thought forms until January 1993. What else happens before then? I believe what's next are the events of Tape 6, Sleeping Dogs, which takes place in late March of 1987. I believe that Simeodyne very clearly knew what they were doing by hiring the miners to unearth the tunnel, and I find it very strange that Paul told the project director that he didn't know who cleared the tunnel, whereas later, Arnold would go on record saying that Paul was the one who cleared the tunnel. In my opinion, this is just a matter of Arnold assuming that it was Paul because he had no reason to question who had actually done it. He probably just wasn't present. Most of the events we see in the series happen in 1987, and Sleeping Dogs takes place earliest in 1987 as we get to see. Which leads me to believe that the opening of the tunnels under Mount Greylock are the catalyst for all of the terrible events that would soon follow, including what happens to the miners, to Arnold, to Tiffany and Alex's baby, the home invasions, and the news network incident. At some point in around these years, Simeodyne decided they wanted to construct Unit 13 for their thought form experiments. Considering Project Stargate in the real world began in 1978, I'd assume it may have been somewhere around that time. This is when they get a contract deal with Paul Morelli and the Morelli Mining Company begin excavating Mount Greylock most certainly with Simeodyne having full knowledge of the tunnels that lie beneath. It is undoubtedly so, in my opinion, that Simeodyne purposefully subjected the miners to the sickness that resulted from the opening of the tunnels, because they were unable to contact anyone except for the project director. I believe that by opening the tunnels, they also released the masked entity. He then stalks the miners in the tree line, preventing them from leaving until they've all succumbed to illness, to which it shows up in the hunting camera at the end of the video. Now, we've gotten to the point in which I need to talk about the break-ins, the home invasions. I believe I actually have a very solid theory as to what goes on in this portion, but for it to work, I actually need to discount something I said earlier. When I pointed out the Max Headroom segment in Tape 4, I noted that I believed the break-ins took place in October because of when the episode aired, but this is actually impossible. It can't have been the case, since Arnold describes them in his logs from April 8th, and he dies on that day. This leaves two options. One, I looked too far into it and the break-ins happened before April 8th, or two, there was more than one set of break-ins, and the one we saw in the second half of Tape 4 was completely separate. With that out of the way, let me describe my theory. I believe that following the sickness that was brought upon the miners, they would escape the construction site and make their way down the mountain, causing the break-ins that we see in Tape 4. I have many reasons to believe this to be the case. For one, it's not unlikely the miners could have made their way down the mountain after the events of Tape 6. The town of Adams and North Adams are actually pretty close to the mountain. Since the timeline of events between Paul's death and the rest of the surviving crew having their pictures taken and displayed in Tape 8 is only a matter of a few days, I believe this could be further evidence for the miners being responsible for the break-ins. The thick black leather glove that reaches its hand through the window in Tape 4 also feels like the kind of thing I'd expect a mine worker to be wearing. And the most crucial bit of evidence, in my opinion, is when the newspaper said people that were doing these break-ins were people that they would have never expected to commit such atrocities. Overall, the timeline is too short for it to have not been them, in my opinion. At least, that's how I feel with our current information. From there, citing the newspaper, multiple arrests were made, and the sick miners were all contained at a location named Site B651. The symptoms of the miners were archived between April 2nd and 3rd, with the cannibalism incident happening on the 6th and Arnold's death being two days later on the 8th. Quite a few things have to have happened between Paul's first message and Arnold's death. Moving on to Tiffany, 
we have an exact date for when the baby was lost, March 31st, and it coincides almost perfectly with the events of sleeping dogs. Based on Jim and Arnold's wording, it seems that many others also lost pregnancies in this time. Two weeks after the home invasions, the local government goes out of its way to assure everyone that everything is back to normal, with Don Wright's show on Channel 13. This is also when we get to see Jim Melgreen's first appearance as a private investigator in a brief newspaper appearance, where he talks about government transparency, which is the exact opposite of what we're seeing happen while Tape 7 plays. We know that some third party interrupts the broadcast, and it clearly isn't aligned with Simeodyne since it directly contradicts their goals, but we also don't really know who they are. From there, Don's co-worker finds him dead in his home, and we don't know who did that either, but it's probably the same person who interrupted the broadcast, considering that the way that Don's face looks is pretty similar to the way that he's found dead in his bed. Then, around mid-May, the events of Tape 10 take place. Tiffany is taken and examined at the medical office. Since it's the most recent episode, we have very few answers as to what any of this really means. Like, who carved the symbol to Tiffany, and why is it the same symbol displayed in the message at the end? Who sent that message? Did Tiffany kill herself, or was she murdered? What is Tiffany's connection to thought forms or the masked entity in her mind? Why is she seemingly still alive at the end of Tape 10? These are all things we just don't really have answers to yet. If you want an answer as to why this person, who I believe to be Jim Melgreen, finds a cassette tape inside of a fucking rat body, don't look at me, I don't know man, I, I don't know what's going on in this series. The next event is the brief surveillance footage we see from October 1990. Whoever this is, they're aware that LBJ and Simeodyne are spying on the people. I don't think this is necessarily public knowledge at this point though, because we know Simeodyne is functioning perfectly fine a few years later, which leads us to Tape 3. Tape 3 is where we finally learn about the thought forms. Funnily enough, this orientation tape is one of at least two tapes, and the other we just don't get to see. It's also meant for Alex, which we know now might be a super important character in this story. I mean, six years after his wife's baby mysteriously disappears and she dies, either by killing herself or some mysterious force, he's volunteering to use the thought form manifestor at Semiodyne? That can't possibly be a coincidence. I think it is at this point that Simudine starts regularly producing artificial thought forms, under the guise of trying to find if they have any defense or military applications. This is also where we see the reintroduction of Dr. Bernard Hayes, a character really we hardly know anything about, but he intrigues me nonetheless. The tape reassures those who are watching for orientation that thought forms are harmless and cannot escape their enclosures. However, we know that that isn't true. About two years after Alex's orientation, we see a little girl named Katie being brutally murdered by her terrifying thought form, which appears to follow her home from the Unit 13 facility on the mountain. Now, you may be wondering why I haven't covered Tape 2 yet. Well, that's because we really don't know when it takes place or what really happens there, but I do have a pretty interesting theory on what happens in it. So there's two different sets of dialogue that we can hear in this tape. The sermon on the radio and the more distorted news report on the two hikers finding a mangled body on the mountain. If it wasn't obvious enough at this point, the sermon on the radio is an allegory for the events of the series. Quotes like, we are not to enter the thicket in search of the lion we may pay dearly, seem to serve as a warning against what Simeo 9 has been doing, uncovering the tunnels under the mountain to release the masked entity trapped within, who reasonably brought nothing but chaos in his wake. Like, why would you even do that? Another quote from the sermon, referring to the devil, we are drawn to him by our hearts with people being compelled to enter the tunnels under Mount Greylock for millennia. The pastor also cites Matthew 15, 19, which reads, For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. And he continues by saying, There is a shadow nested deep within our hearts, within our minds, within a place most people don't even know exists within themselves. This sermon perfectly describes Jung's idea of the shadow, and it's definitely meant to be referring to the thought forms alongside it. The other set of dialogue, which is more distorted, speaks of two hikers finding a mangled human corpse on Mount Greylock. The two men remained anonymous in their testimony, but had been hiking the mountain for over a decade. With all of the context now here, I want to offer my theory as to what happens in Tape 2. 
I think the person who we see driving throughout the mountain had a reason to be searching for something. They went out of their way to bring a camera in their vehicle, stopped on the side of the road pretty deliberately at a gate, and then encountered a trail of blood that led them to some anomalous thing behind this tree. I think this individual may have been responding to the report of those two hikers finding a body on the mountain. However, I believe a thought form actually took this individual's vehicle. We can see it suddenly cuts to it being back on the road, driving slowly, fiddling with the high beams and the turn signal almost as if it's trying to learn how to drive. The banging that we hear on the outside of the car, in my opinion, is not something else trying to get in the vehicle, but the original vehicle owner trying to get back into his own car. Think about it. If you saw your car driving away when you're on a snowy mountain back road in the middle of the night after you found a trail of blood, you might even have been attacked by some random ghost thing, you're gonna try desperately to try to get back into your car and figure out what the hell is going on. After that, who knows if they did get back into the car or not. It's either them or the thought form speeding down the road to escape whatever happened. Unfortunately, this tape has so little concrete information, it makes it impossible to directly relate to any of the other series events as of now, and even the theory that I just described is probably completely wrong. But hey, I like it. And finally, we have tape one. I think it's pretty safe to say that this is the farthest point in the series. I believe the person in this tape is Jim Melgreen, our private investigator who seems to be pretty invested in figuring out what's going on and putting all the pieces together. It seems like the building he's in is an old and decrepit Semiodyne facility. At least, that's how it feels by the fact that they managed to download information from the computers after booting the system back online. Interestingly enough, though we do see a morgue in Tape 10, and the camera that's broken in Tape 1 is a morgue. It may be possible that rather than being a Semiodyne facility, this building is the medical office that we saw quite recently, but who knows. I believe this is as far as we go in Greylock so far, and although there's an overwhelming amount of information, the story still remains a mystery. I do have to apologize, I really would have preferred to have been able to give you guys a more solid theory, but as you can tell, the series is most likely still in its infancy, continuing to set up details without payoffs simply because the payoffs haven't happened yet. There's a remarkable amount of hard work and effort being put into Greylock from an entire dedicated team of creators, and I'd like to personally thank Rob Gavigan and his team for making such an amazing analog horror series. If you're looking for an alternate perspective, you should check out this other Greylock analysis by my friend and fellow content creator Chromudgeon, and comment any theories you might have below. And of course, if you've enjoyed this analog horror series so far, make sure to go subscribe to the channel in the description. If you had a good time, it would mean the world if you subscribed for more content like it, and turned on post notifications so you never miss a video. If you want to support me further, since this video took so, so much time to make, $5 channel members get early access to new videos, and you can also follow my socials and join the community Discord server. And that being said, that's going to be all from me. I hope you enjoyed the video. Until next time.